No. Hey, Jason. Hey there, Hola. Melissa. How are you? Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hey, Willie. So, Hi. Jason, hey, I told you everyone at the dance last Friday, uh, Saturday night. I uh, told them what? Sorry. About the sign language in sept uh, September. Right. Right. Where are you, Donnie? Yes. Mr. Harmon, how are you? Did I? Hey, Donnie. Yeah. Or did I not? Hey, Donnie. I for the list of people. Ah. What? You did, but my afternoon went crazy. That's true. recipe for uh, cheesecake bars. Oh, you're going to be making cheesecake bars? <laughs> I have to do sugar-free ones. <laughs> That's okay. I'm making brownies next Tuesday in my class, so for you. I'm making banana pudding tomorrow at my cooking uh, class. Oh, nice. I can't I'm wait cool. to do the egg drop thing. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so do I. That's the one that Nicole's running or the other one? I uh, should uh, do the slime. Nicole's egg making slime. Yeah. I make drop. I have to practice tomorrow. Nicole, <laughs> I want to put you on that, Jason. I'm going to practice too. I'm gonna hard for boil that. my I can't. Wait, I can't. I cannot wait. I'm going to say, my mom. My mom got a stuff. I cannot wait to throw a slime sure at the screen. Break. That I need to do. <laughs> okay, that I'm I need to do. Uh, weird science with my buddy Bill and I. <laughs> it looks like um. Well, I have one. I think I, I met him. I don't remember. So crazy hat or Saturday night? No. Uh, this Saturday no, is is, um, the, is the is the decades moldy oldies moldy oldies yes oh having a dance party on Saturday night still or no why wouldn't we be yeah it's still yeah. there I'm just saying because I'm not going to do it uh, Chris came back on the eighth yeah if it's but, Saturday it's dance party for the most part yeah generally yeah because I know that he's going to be off um when is it I forgot twenty ninth I think twenty ninth yeah, yeah. yeah. twenty ninth. Yeah, so if you, if any of you want to have a shot at being DJ, the 29th is over. Kopeck. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe Jason Trimmel would join. DJ Chris is oh, playing. Yeah. Oh, no, I DJ Jason Trimmel. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. busy with his kids. My dad and is stuff. giving the tour of the shop. Okay, okay cool. Put that in there. I see that. <laughs> so y'all will get to meet my dad tonight. Okay. Mr. Eckerd. Cool. Woo. cool. Woo. Back home. Thor. What do you call him? <laughs> what? Thor? Dork. Loser. Oh, Dork? Dork? I thought it was Thor. No, I would never. Oh, I never thought mind. Thor I because it. he had that's an right. animal. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I, I thought you were saying, too. No. That, that's that's Dork. cool, Dad. Hi, David. Don't you mean oh, Doink? Nice. Doink the clown? Hey, Elena. Hey, Elena. Hey, Elena. Hey, Elena. Hello. Hey, Elena. Hello. Hey, Elena. No, I will not be nice. Just because you're making <laughs> knives doesn't mean you can't be rude. Hi, Melissa. So nice to have off the table tonight. Yeah. Hi, Kayla. <laughs> oh, that's my <laughs> bad. Your <laughs> name's being changed, Danielle. I'm putting that out there. Huh? Your name's being changed. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey, Thomas. Oh, I'll take your message, Kayla. I like that. I'm doing it. Hey, David. Hey, Kayla. You should pull back your message again. I like her. Hey, Lakiva. The man. The man. Hey. Where's Joe? He's hiding. Yeah, where's Joe? Better. This is here, Daniel. Here. Hey, Jason. 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 Hey, Jason.
Oh, and he wants to know where his are. <laughs> Who does? Brandon Ermintrout. Uh, there's. They should be in the mail. I made them. So. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told him. Oh. You made them yourself. Seems Rebecca. to be some delay. Uh -huh. Hey, Jesse. I told Becky. him. Becky. Hey there. The man. Do you want to keep it? Oh, it's a change name, huh? Did he miss me on the side of the night? Tonight? We if do. You Where are you? Unmute yourself. Oh. I will boot. I had to open the night. Oh, my. Oh, I got to unmute themselves but, tonight. But I'm not. I didn't boot on the side of the night thing. I'm not going to touch it. Bye. Bye. All right. One more minute, and we're going to get going. Then I'm going to. I thought there would be more people over. on right now. Yeah, I don't know how many people. Oh, 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 all right, Pete. We're, we're putting you we're putting you on mute except Silence. for my two co-hosts okay. yeah Damn, you got that i already got it there we go gotta get sam there you go all right welcome everybody uh Welcome to Tuesday Night Social Club. I have been looking forward to this for some time. Um, yes. Tonight, yes. Uh, you know her as your co-host yes. and help her on Zoom. Yes. Uh, but tonight, she's our guest. So uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Kayla Eckert, who will share with us her, uh, well, it's not really, a, is it a hobby, Kayla, or is it a... It's a, a hobby that may turn into a job. <laughs> may turn into a job. So, uh, so Kayla, uh, I'm going to just pass it over to Kayla. Well, I've already started my screen share. Go to hold on, the slideshow. Play from start. So, yeah, this is my class of knife making. And as we begin... I have to put some safety measures and warnings out there. Do not try this at home without extensive training and safety measures. Never work when you're drowsy, preoccupied, or intoxicated. Always wear safety goggles when working in the shop. Never wear loose clothing when using the power tools. And never startle or interrupt another worker at a power machine. These and are good warnings. Yeah. The power tools used are the power hammer, the forge press, the angle grinder, the belt grinder, and the drill press. And then the second photo was of the orc sword that we made. Oh, snap. Uh, well, that's rare. Waiting for my annoying sister and her best friend to get out of the kitchen. So, Kayla, what that you you guys made that knife that you were just showing us back there? Oh. Cool. And what's that knife used for? So that is an orc sword from the Lord of the Rings. An orc oh, well sword. Cool. Hey. All right. And then, of course. Second one, the step two is choosing the knife for the steel. So you have uh, plain carbon steel, manganese steels, nickel steels, chromium steels, the medium chromium steels, which is the best for the knives, and the chromium vanadium steels. And there are many different ways to make a knife, but this is what works for us so far. So you clamp down the middle before you cut it. We then put it in the forge. Our forge gets up to 2,000 degrees. You can start hammering it out once it gets to 1,800 degrees and is a bright orangish yellow color. And then we hammer it out as close to finishing shape as we possibly can. And then once you do that, you have to drill the holes and then heat treat it. So you heat the metal to a non-magnetic, then dip it into the vegetable oil that has been that has been cooked 
to 140 degrees. And then you drill holes in the metal where you want your pins at. Hey, Kayla, I think I missed step four. I, I might have blinked or something. Four was oh, the, yeah. oh, I did miss a step. So step four was the sanding. You remove oh. all the forge scale. The stuff is all gray and black. And then you get it as close to finished shape. So we went through that. And then step six is the tempering, which you put it into your oven. So you put it in the oven at a general temperature of 400 degrees Fahrenheit for two cycles, three times, and then you want to be stupid. There we go. Step seven. You pick the material for your handle, then drill the, drill the holes to match the holes in the knife. And then you sand the handles with some very weird belts. And you sand away any excess material, then refine the whole knife. You're just joined. That was just Kelly. Okay. Let me know if you guys want me to start back over for everybody. No, we're good. So step nine is the sharpening, which is the belt sander. So you start sharpening the knife on the belt sander. And then step 10 is the finished product. Excellent. And then you have the knife completed. There are a lot of equipment and tools that can be used. You can also use basic tools and time. So that was the slideshow I had. OK, so. Um... Do you want to do the tour first and then come back and ask questions? Or how would you like to? I don't really care how we do it. Let me see what my dad wants to do. OK. I'm mute. All right. So Kayla's going to go check in with her father, who's in the area where they, uh, I think, do all this work, or at least the area they do most of the work. Can you play some uh, Jeopardy music till then, please? <laughs> Isn't there a song, Mac the Knife? Should we play Mac the Knife? That would be the way to go. So, um, so oh, Kayla's back. We are going to do the tour. I'm waiting for my dad to come outside. So right. I have to literally walk through the kitchen, through my very <laughs> huge kitchen. Oh my gosh, we're getting a tour of her house. Yeah, that's a bonus tonight. So You get a little bonus. All right. The Eckerd Estate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Back. All right, so we're going to, and what do you call it? Is this the garage? It's pretty much the shop. The shop, all right. As you can see, the vehicle's in the, the driveway. As I'm carrying a very expensive MacBook Air. <laughs> trying not to drop it. Please don't. It's my right. sister's laptop anyway, so. <laughs> so we're heading to the shop, everybody. This is where all the action is. Look at, oh my gosh, look at all that equipment. That's pretty big. All right. Now I'm getting yelled at. <laughs> Do we have to wait? All right, so there's lots of material. And if there's any questions currently, so Kayla talked about the material they used, uh, different kinds of steel. Uh, I think when she's back, we'll ask her, how, where, where do you get that? I wouldn't even know where to buy all of that. So and the handle material and so there's lots we just of saw her dad walking in yeah <laughs> just to remind kayla this is being recorded <laughs> mm -hmm. she's got a dog yeah. in the background too i see look at that it's mm -hmm. it's a lot going on right now so again the shop looks huge I'm, yeah it's, it's so, basically a barn 
Kayla, yeah. you're going to walk us through the various machines and stuff yeah. where your dad is? Yeah. My dad is. I'm just going to hold the laptop. You're going to, that works for me. Mm -hmm. And what's your dog's name in the background there? The one that just showed up. Can't hear you. Now you can. Yeah. <laughs> So the black one is Rocco, and then the one who just walked right there, that's Maggie. Oh, nice. He's a pit bull basset hound mix. What about Rocco? He's a German shepherd corgi. Okay. Legs of a corgi. Like the Queen of England What's corgi. Quite the, quite the, the shop will be amazing to see. Ready? Oh, we're moving. Here we go, team. Well, in the shop. Yeah, we're just so this is my dad right there. Hello. <laughs> I'm Dan. Hi, Mr. Kurt. How are you? And Kayla's <laughs> going to now yep. switch yep. the laptop to right here. Yep. And That's why you want me to fix. All right, don't put your can over top of it right. because then you cover the camera. Okay. <laughs> Right about there should be fine. And we're going to do a quick shop tour here on the different uh, equipment that we use. Um, but just so everyone knows, in ancient times, you could make a knife for your kitchen or a weapon of any kind with uh, very primitive tools. You could use a couple files. You could use a uh, Kayla. Stay focused. <laughs> You, you can uh, use uh, hard stone as your anvils to beat things on. So it doesn't require all of this equipment to get to the same finish line of a usable tool at the end. So uh, we'll show you what we use, which helps us to get to the finish line faster versus ancient times. Um, Where you want to start? We'll start right here. So, so this is our anvil. Lower the camera a little bit. So this is an anvil that you do all your beating on your metal. Once you get your uh, metal heated up to a real high temperature, this is where most of the magic will happen. Right here, you have different parts of the anvil for yep. different purposes, and we don't need to go in, into all of those, but that's the anvil that every shop will eventually need. Here is a our second anvil. No, this is this is our first anvil right. that was made uh, at a railroad track. So it it's a really hard, thick metal yep. that you know if you're trying to save money, which we were at the beginning, we were just uh, using what we had available. So we cut the top piece off of the back of some Kayla because I did most of that work. Yeah. Well, here you can see it's got. A railroad track right here, yep. and this top piece used to be a railroad part of the same track that we cut a section off like. and shaped it out. And it was a good beginner anvil for us when we first started, and we still use it a lot today because it you, know, you get certain shapes on different anvils and you can use them for different purposes. So, uh, everyone uh, who starts to swing a hammer will want multiple hammers. So as time goes on, you'll like different hammers for diff different purposes. So you see the back ends of both of these hammers are different depending on how you want to move your metal. So the way you can, in your head, you can picture the metal yep. is basically uh, like Play-Doh. So the same thing with Play-Doh, you shape it and you use your hands for it, but this is in place of your hands. and metal will start to move like play-doh once you heat it up to about 1800 degrees so i'll show you the forge here next yep. right now on. you can't Little. you can't move forge. metal unless you heat it up first the only way you can yeah, yeah. move metal without heating it is to use a file or an angle grinder or a different method but that's not going to get you to shape the metal so in, in our forge here we built two forges. We built okay. two forges. Uh, yep. We built these ourselves. Uh, this is a smaller forge, so we could do smaller work. And this is our 
larger forge for doing large objects or really long yeah. objects because this has a hole in the back there. Um, do you want me to get closer so that they can see yeah. it there? What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'll, I'm going to start up the uh, here, keep the camera faced on. I'm trying to we'll talk about. Um, I'm going to light the forge up here just so you can see the type of heat that yeah. we're talking about. And over time, it gets even hotter as the heat builds up on the inside because it's got a lot of insulation through here. And it also has um, something that's called refractory. Now, the refractory is something that's sort of like a, a concrete, but it's got special properties that will reflect the heat back to the center. So once the side walls start to get hot, the refractory will keep the hottest part out in front of it, which is in, in your main chamber here, which is really what you want. So I'll show I'm gonna show you part. real quick what this looks and sounds like. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So, Do not try this at home. Well, one, one thing you can uh, compare this to would be if you could imagine what dragon's breath would look like. This is basically what you're getting. Wow. So there, on this larger board, there's two burners. Yeah. So if you go to the side a little bit, Kayla, you can see where it's got two access points where the propane is coming into uh, the jets that we have here that spit out the fire in the center. So that's all. I just wanted to show you what it looks like and sounds like. So, so Kayla, Kayla, and Kayla's dad—is that the, the unit that goes up to fifteen hundred degrees, or? Um, no, well, you can keep it at fifteen hundred degrees, but that just depends on what yeah. work you're trying to do. Uh, oh, okay. This one can actually, this forge can get up to about twenty-two hundred degrees. Wow. Um, which. I'll explain uh, Damascus here in a minute. Hold on, something's okay. popping up on the screen. Uh, no, remind me later. Okay, um, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you some different temperatures uh, when I show you uh, some metals uh, once I finish the equipment tour. Um, cool. So this is the, forge, the forges that we use to heat the metal. The anvils are where we shape the metal. Yep. Now we do have a couple of specialty tools and one is called a power hammer. So hmm. over here, uh, yep. you see, you I'm might need to back, back up. up a little bit further on that one. Yeah, and show uh, it right here. Okay, uh, okay. so yeah, right yeah. here, this is a setup that uh, we built ourselves again. Um, he built. It has, parts on it that will spin this tire yeah. at a real high speed and it has a 75 pound hammer right here so you can hold your metal there with your tongs so that's basically uh taking some of the stress off of your shoulder and elbow yeah. when you have a whole lot of metal to move you can use this to it can't do all the work for you, but it can do a good uh, part good of the heavy lifting for you. Yeah. So that's called a power hammer. And uh, here's the, uh, give me an tongs. example of tongs. So these are what you're going to hold your metal. Because yeah. when you're heating the metal up at real high temperatures, you need to wear protective gloves and mask. And, you know, you want to so. wear all the safety equipment. But this is how you hold the metal far enough away from you so you're not too close to the metal. Because anytime you get up to 18 or so 100 degrees, um, just being close to that uh, type of temperature can really burn you. So you got to keep it far enough away from you. So there are lots of different tongs depending on the project that you're working on. So you can, you can make tongs of lots of different shapes depending on what the metal looks like that you need to hold. So these are tongs. So I don't know what to wear. Respirator. Why do you need a respirator? Oh, you want to show safety equipment. Well, we, we, um, I think safety, we'll, we'll do safety equipment if you have questions. You know, since you're not in the forge, anyone who comes into the forge uh, has to go over some safety procedures and stuff. Yeah. You know, you always have to have safety in mind when you're in this type of environment because there's so many things that you could get injured uh, pretty easily. So. 
only if someone has questions about that or if you guys would ever come by to hang with Kayla and want to see stuff, then we would go over to safety stuff. So other than that, that's boring. So um, here's another piece of uh, equipment here that I got to turn the camera again. It's pretty similar to uh, yeah. back up. Right. right here. It, it's similar in the fact of this is called a press. It's a 16 ton press that it'll make a little noise here, so bear with it. But there's a lever or a paddle, you can control it either way. Right here, you see where there's dies. It just presses down your metal, but it can press it with 1600 uh, or 16 tons. So it's got a lot of pressure, pressure for certain projects that you're working on, you want to use this versus the power hammer and vice versa. So just depending on what you're working on at the time, um, you would pick the machine that would that's move the metal you. how you want it moved. So that's called a press. Now that, that one we did not build. So nope. most, most of the other equipment in here, we put together ourselves and built ourselves. With our hands. Um, here is one of the, uh, most fun tools in the shop here. This is called belt a grinder. belt grinder or belt sander. And what it uses are these belts. belts here that are two inches wide by 72 inches long. So they have lots of different grits. So depending on, you know, if you're trying to uh, pull a lot of metal off fast, use higher grit belts or when you're getting close to finishing work, then you would use uh, finer grits, but there's lots of them on the market because the uh, step over here, Kayla, looks like right. the sunlight starting to drown out um, and back up just a little. Okay, so oh, that's, yeah. that's basically the size of the belts. I helped build and it. And once you put your belt on there, you have pulleys on it, you have a motor, and there's a uh, control here that's called a var variable frequency drive. So that will control the speed of the belt and how fast you want it to spin. So I'll just show you how it runs real quick. This gives you an idea. I'll show you the belt yeah. under a little closer. So you get an idea of how fast that belt is spinning. It's uh, Here's a piece of wood just to show you. So to reshape stuff pretty fast for you, uh, just because it's spinning too yeah. fast. And do not attempt that at home. <laughs> um, let's see, those are the main tools um, that you will use. We have lots of other things that are yep. just common for shops. Um, but let me yeah, show you the, um, the metal now. Um, in my shop now, for knife and sword making, there's probably two dozen different metals that you can use, but you have to have uh, specialty equipment for a lot of the stainless steel metals or some of the exotic metals. So we um, mostly use the- High chromium. No, that's just one. Yeah. We, use, we use the more common metals that are easier to work with and a little bit more forgiving if you don't have your temperatures at the exact pinpoint. Some of them get really crazy and you have to have specialty ovens that can hold really high temperatures exactly at those high temperatures for a couple of hours in order to make the, the uh, knives proper. Um, so, come over here, Kayla. Yep. All right, so here's an example walkie, walkie. of yeah, uh, this one's called 5160. Spring steel. So this is uh, also known as spring steel. So this is actually a leaf spring off of a class eight truck. So and I can go over that. Yeah, but anyway, it's, it's also known as a mono steel. So it's yep. one metal by itself without any other uh, specialty things mixed into it. So they also call this mono steel. So mm -hmm. that's what it looks like at the beginning. Um, Kayla was supposed to show you one of her knives, but mono steel, when you're done with it. Oh, Jason has seen photos of it. Okay. Of well, I'm just going to give you a uh, different example here. 
So when you, when you take a mono steel, now this one's not completed yet, the handle's not on it yet, but this gives you an idea on what the mono steel is gonna look like. It's gonna give you the high shine. You can either stop at a satin finish or you can keep uh, sanding it with higher grit sandpapers to give it a mirror finish. So that's what a mono steel is gonna give you as an end product. It, you know, not necessarily, you can put them any shape you want, but uh, that's sure. gonna be the kind of finished product. I, Kayla, do you think I'm not planning that? Now? So that's a mono steel or 5160 spring steel. Um, and the handle's still not put on this one just yet. Um, now, another metal that we do in our shop here is called Damascus. Um, Damascus is when you make one solid piece of metal out of multiple metals. So here's an example I put up for you on Damascus steel. So what, what you get is there's two different metals here. So they look the same when they start, but you'll see that I put a magic marker mark on this one because this one is the metal that has more nickel in it. So this metal is called 15, N is in Nancy, 20. So 15 in 20 is the name of that metal. This metal is called 1084. So 10 series metals are a very common metal used in a lot of knives and swords. Um, but once you take these two metals and you stack them up, into one so once billet. you stack these up, you will take your, your welder and put a little a uh, couple of beads on it to start with. So then you're going to take this stack and you're going to hammer it down into a nice flat bar that you will then be able to. Here is an example of the bar. So that, that stack here turns into this stack here will look like this when you're done but only, only longer. This is a piece I cut off. So this will turn into this. Now it looks just like it's one single piece of metal. And that's because it was forge welded. You take this up to the, you know, uh, really high temperatures in your forge. And that's why when, usually when you're doing just mono steels, your forge, you're gonna keep it around uh, 19, 1800 degrees for just hammering out mono steels. When you're doing Damascus, you need to bring that up because you want these metals to be close to their melting mm -hmm. point because you want to get them to be their to to be the final product of one piece of metal. So these were or these will turn into this. And this is this piece here I made last week by starting out with a stack like this. Now, once you take that Damascus, so you beat it down to a bar like this, and Damascus is really fun to work with, so it's, it's really rewarding uh, when you get to the finished product. And you do a lot of extra work to get Damascus, but when you, what, cancel here real quick. Once you get to see what Damascus looks like when you're finished with it, now this knife you're still be is really not- impressed. This knife is still, not completely finished, I still have some more work to go. But this is what Damascus will look like. Very cool. And the reason why you see those uh, different lines is because it's a pattern. This is um, the reason why you see, Kayla, <laughs> you're going right. to put me, you put me off track by mentioning things. Um, the reason why you see the different metals in it, you see uh, a shiny metal and then a darker metal. The two metals I told you about a moment ago, the 15N as in Nancy, 20, the N stands for nickel. So the 1084 is the darker metal you see in there. The 15N20 is the shinier metal that you see in there because it has nickel in it. So once you take your bar, and so with this bar here, my next step would be to hammer it out to shape in whatever shape I, you know, plan ahead of time. And I will hammer it out. And once you finish hammering it out, you'll end up with, depending on what you're working on, 
Here, here's what it will look like when you're done hammering the uh, metal. the metal out on the anvil or the power hammer. So it's a rough shape. So this shows you just a rough, still gray scale all over it. That's called forge yeah. scale. So here's another example that's going example that's going to eventually be a dagger. But you can see the the rough shape. So you hammer it out to these shapes before you take it to the finish step. So these will eventually be shiny and pretty like the other ones, but this is just one of the steps that you have to use to get to the end results. Now, once you're done with either knife, you know, no matter what kind of metal you're working with, you always want to plan it ahead of time so you know where you're going to be at the end. So then you pick your, oh, you got to, sorry, technical difficulties. No. Are you clear? Yep. Okay. You're good. All right. So then you pick out the wood or different materials that you can use to make a handle and you have to put pins in it. So that way you have a mechanical con connection and uh, an epoxy connection. So mm -hmm. we use epoxy and mechanical. Uh, there's two holes in here. You just can't really see them uh, because they're it, uh, taking it to a high shine. So the pins that are a little bit smaller than these are also in here somewhere. But you uh, get the handle shape to whatever is comfortable for you or whoever you're making it for. You know, you can make handles as large as you like or as small. And since this is a kitchen knife, it's a petite handle. And this particular wood is an all natural wood called Purple Heart. So they use this type of wood in a lot of uh, military type knives. So here's another that has a different handle. So this handle is an acrylic handle. So it's got the pretty colors in it. Yeah. You see the nice shine to it. Yeah. yeah. So that's an acrylic handle. And these are stainless steel. These are called bolsters. So at the beginning part where your fingers go here, you can have a, uh, a bolster in the front, really just for decorative purposes. And then in the, on the back end of the knife, you can do lots of different things that I won't confuse you with those just yet. So for the kitchen knives, you can just finish it just like that. And the, and the metal that you see there, that is not just like painted on or anything. That's the actual metal that is inside this knife. So that won't wear off or rub away or anything like that. Um, one other thing I'll point out to you is once you get your billet down to this size and then you shape it, it will look like this. So your Damascus will look like this until you do one key part. You're going to dip it in acid. Ferric chlor, or not ferric chlor, um, mm -hmm. All right, ferric chloride uh, acid. is the acid that you'll dip your Damascus knives in. And what it will do is that it will erode the 1084 metal and it will leave the nickel. So the acid doesn't work on nickel. So that's why the darker metal when there's a 1084, it actually gets eaten away a little bit. So if you rubbed your fingernail on that knife with the Damascus pattern, you'll feel the different little layers. It's real subtle, you know, cause you don't want it to be a real big contrast when you're cutting tomatoes and stuff. You still want it to be nice and smooth and clean cuts, but uh, this one here is not Damascus, so this one you wouldn't dip into the acid, but nope. this is what it will look like before you put it in the acid. And when you do put it in the acid, you have to uh, do that multiple times. So you put it in for 15 minutes, you take it out, you have to wash it, and then repeat that process uh, three times at a minimum. So that's the different metals that we work with. And like I said, there's lots of different exotic metals that people can use. Just depends on how you have your shop set up and what type of equipment you have to work with. So, but it's all a lot of fun, so. Yeah. Um, I think we covered all the main things yep. in here. Any questions? Uh, let's see, I think we had some in the chat, right, Sam? Uh, laptop on the 
Yeah, we have a couple questions. Let me just go back because I believe that I saw her chat. I got you, Kayla. One of them, I got you, Kayla. One, You're busy. One of them was the, the weight of the hammers. They were asking how heavy they are compared to each other. Well, um, you can go with any weight that is comfortable for you. But when you're first starting out, you want to use the lighter weight hammers because uh, when you're hammering on something repetitive, repetitively, uh, it actually takes a little while to build up that skill. So you're going to miss a lot. So if you're going with the real heavy hammer, uh, then you're going to miss a lot and you're probably going to cause damage to your anvil if you start too heavy. So the lighter hammers, I have half a pound hammers all the way up to three pound hammers. So three pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're swinging it for 30 minutes, uh, it, it's a lot. So I, I don't really use a three pound hammer for long hammering sessions. So uh, I usually stick with the uh, two and a half pound. That's my go-to. Don't eat. Don't need to go to the gym after 30 minutes for that. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Yeah, and with this heat out here, you definitely uh, will burn some calories with sweat. Mm -hmm. I know Elena's got a question. I'm actually going to What up, Elena? Need her for that. All right. Okay, so my question is, how long does it take you guys, you know, depending on if it's a custom knife or sort, how long does it take on average to make it from start for to finish? For a knife, it takes about two weeks. Um, let me give a little bit more than the two week. Um, if, see, I, I, I don't know if Kayla mentioned it, but I have uh, lots of back issues. Um, He's had, had several back surgeries. Yeah, quite a few back surgeries. So if I were completely healthy and didn't have any restrictions, um, and there's two different times, one for the mono steel and one for Damascus. So if you're making Damascus, it takes an extra two days to even make your metal that you're going to work with. Um, so if, if I didn't have limitations and I was making a, a mirror finish type knife, uh, probably about five days would be a, a fair amount. For Damascus, you're looking, you know, maybe seven days give you the extra two days to make the uh, billet of the metal that you're going to use. All right. I know that uh, Melissa's got a question. Let's go to Melissa. Okay. <clears throat> I want to know if it's heavy or light. What, the metal? On the hammer for the, uh, the machine that you use. So she wants to know. Light or heavy? Uh, Machine the, on the power hammer, it's a very heavy hammer. It's, yeah. it's actually a 75 pound hammer, which I'm not I, even. I wouldn't want to pick up 75 pounds with one arm. That's what but, Lil wanted to know. Yeah, <laughs> really, it's a very, very heavy. It goes hammer. light or heavy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very heavy and it's very loud. So you have to put on ear, ear protection, protection when you use it. So my neighbors can hear it. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how long did you make the knife? How many years? I mean, um, I've only been doing this for about uh, two years now, so I'm I'm still relatively new to it. So uh, still still learning every day. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Any other questions? Wait, no, nope, that's it. I see you there. After you completed the finished product of the knights, um, how, well, how was the price, the price of the knives? Um, Quanto cuesta? Si, quanto cuesta, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it depends on the type of handle materials you pick and if you want bolsters or not. So, so the low price would probably be around $150. The high price could be as high as you know, $260. And the difference is these knives will last probably about a hundred years. If you buy a knife from say, uh, uh, outdoor world or where, you know, one of the sporting utility type places, those knives usually can last, you know, depending on how much you use them. They, they only last a, 
a year or two if you have heavy use. So these type of knives are also called generational knives. So they'll last generations and these type of knives people actually hand down to relatives, you know, when they get old and stop cooking for themselves, they'll pass these type of knives down. So that's why they're called generational knives. You know, uh, like a fa family heirloom type knife. I know Willie's got a question as well. As Willie's got one. Let me right. go to Willie. Okay, so my question is, how, when you wear your gloves, did it make you feel safe when you're not going to touch your hand on the burner? Um, well, when you first start out, you use really thick gloves. So yeah. you have to use ones that are going to be really protective against the, the high temperatures. Here's the one you cut. And no, you, they don't need to know about me cutting my hand, Kayla. So you'll use thicker gloves when you first start out. And then as you start to get your skills down a little, you can go to some lighter gloves, but you still want, you know, some nice leather gloves. Um, these, are my... these you don't want to use when you're doing no. the heat process. Those are for when you're doing the handle and stuff. So you want to use some nice leather gloves uh, when you're working with the high temperature metals. Uh, and again, it just depends on your comfort level. level. As you get better at it, you will prefer the lighter gloves. My dad used to use regular gloves, especially when he tried to mow the grass. And the well, and another you, question I wanted great. to tell you. These type of gloves are great for weed whacking or mowing the lawn. Yeah, so, mowing the lawn. That's what I, that's my, my dad. But another question I want to say is, how much weight do you want to put on the knives? How much weight? Um, yes. Well, here, I'll show you an example here. So the That's a really heavier, good question. Actually. the worse. Right. So, so on slide to your right, just a little. Um, when you're working with a knife like this, this is called a Bowie knife. Now just pretend it has a handle on it. So this knife is a little more heavy duty. You'll be using this for camping and you can cut limb, you know, uh, tree limbs down with it. Uh, yeah. So this is going to be a little heavier because it's, more heavy duty. You're going to be chopping stuff with this all the time. Um, so this one, you probably want uh, still less than a pound. So this won't weigh one pound. And when you get to the kitchen knives, you, you want these to be really nice and light. So the, these need to be light so they can uh, work fast. And when you're chopping in your kitchen, you want it nice and yeah. light. So if you're doing a lot of chopping, uh, you're hands and fingers don't get all fatigued. So uh, these are going to be in the, uh, you know, less, less than a half a pound for uh, a kitchen knife. And um, when I say less than a half a pound, it's going to be a lot less than a half a pound. So, you know, uh, if I had a scale right here, uh, which <clears throat> I, um, I was probably around 25, 27 ounces. Yeah. Yeah. So your kitchen knives, you can see you want them nice and thin. So you don't, really don't have much Material. thickness here. And then when you get to the Bowie knives, you want, you know, this is the back spine of it, but you can see it's thicker. Oh, wow. Because this one here, you're going to be doing a lot of chopping. This one, you're going to be doing a lot of chopping of tomatoes. <laughs> so you or want especially to, you're gonna get a lot of chopping of lettuce. Yeah, yep. yeah. So this this one you can use the kitchen all day. It's nice and light, and it doesn't. It has not been sharpened yet. But once it is, you'll it's be, gonna be sharp. you'll be able to just uh, if you held a piece of paper here, you'd be able to just slice through the piece of paper like it wasn't there. So oh wow! Kitchen knives, I put an extra sharp edge on them to where you can hold a tomato in the palm of your hand and you can slice the tomato without the tomato falling off. So you can just slice right through it. Right. These, gotta... you don't put that fine an edge on it nope. because if you go real sharp and you chop on a tree branch, it's gonna uh, make the metal bend back a little bit. So these edges, you want a little, little tougher. Let's go to... Really cool. I know Danielle's got a question. Danielle. Uh, do, do you wear um, gloves and 
safety goggles. Machine. So we have to wear safety goggles and gloves when we're using all the power tools. Okay. Yeah, when you're using any of the equipment, uh, eyewear is mandatory. Gloves are mandatory. I'll and show them. Ear protection, I still <laughs> believe, is optional. There we go. That's so true. you always have to wear them. Okay. Unless you want to get, unless you want to get your eyes on fire. Power hammer, you need these. <laughs> Bam! Get me my. I had to. <laughs> I, I. Next question. Uh, any other? So, anybody else got any questions? I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. Um, you, well, you mentioned the, the kitchen knives and the Bowie knife. Uh, but earlier you mentioned swords too. How? What's the biggest knife you guys have made? Um, that's a good question, the Jason. The largest thing I've made, uh, I guess Kayla didn't show you the picture there. I showed um, them the orc sword. Okay, that orc, the orc sword that Kayla showed you was 29 inches long. Oh, that's wow. That's really cool. Just shy so of three feet there, yeah. Okay. Also very heavy um, because the uh, owner wanted it to be the same weight as if an orc were the one yep. using it. So we wanted it to feel heavy um, yeah. to go along with, you know, the movie. So. <laughs> Where do you find out the weight of an orc sword? I don't know. <laughs> do you have to go back to back to New Zealand all of a sudden or something? <laughs> you can make it whatever weight you want, you know, so. Okay. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the cool, what, one of the cool aspects is you can buy Lord of the Rings swords on the internet all day long for, yep. you know, cheap, you know, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, just for wall hangers. You know, they're pretty mm -hmm. and they're, that's all they are is decorative. So, oh, I just realized. Yeah, if you so. took one of those knives that, or swords out to the woods and tried to cut a tree down with it, all you're going to do is break your pretty sword. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. The orc sword uh, was a $300 sword, but yeah. the you, you can't stop playing, can you? No, I was trying to fix that. <laughs> the orc sword, one of the tests we put it through just to make sure it was what's called battle ready. Yeah. Uh, we took the sword out and chopped down a, a tree that was about 10 inches thick. It uh, worked. So we chopped down the tree just to show how tough that sword was. And it, uh, after chopping down the tree, it did no damage to the uh, sword at all. And it actually didn't even need to be resharpened after cutting down a tree. So that's the difference between the stuff that you get at, you know, uh, online or most places online that are decorative uh, wall hangers versus your, the stuff we make out of here is fully functional and ready for anything. So if that zombie apocalypse ever happens, that sword is going to come in handy. So there you go. <laughs> the best $300 he spent. <laughs> I actually got a question. Have you guys ever made throwing knives before? Uh, not not yet. yet. It's on my to-do list, but uh, not yet. I do own some throwing knives. Um, Japanese throwing, throwing knives. Yeah. But, uh, can you lift it up a little yep. bit my head's down? Oh. Elena, I know you had a question, another question about Renaissance. Hi, up, Elena. Elena. That, did you ask that yet? I forget. Yeah, so also what you said, you know, like about like you make the knives and swords to be heirloom things. And that made me think of um, my Papa Charlie and my Uncle Donnie because they scour out um, estate sales and they have a lot, of, they have many um, knives, swords, and um, throwing stars. Like we joke that they got enough, enough weapons to build a small <laughs> army. But um, <laughs> My question is, have you ever, would you ever consider, you know, setting up like a shop at events like, you know, the, the Maryland Ren Fair or like, um, um, there, there, shows? Are, there are blacksmiths that already do that at the Renaissance Fair. Uh, we've actually yeah, um, talked to the blacksmith at uh, one Renaissance Fair that we went to. And uh, uh, my back isn't good enough for me to do that be able yet. to transport all this you know heavy stuff that you would want to take with you um mm -hmm. down the road hopefully my back's healthy enough i would you know consider doing things like that just to show people you know how it's done and have a little fun mm -hmm. yeah because we me and my dad when we go to the rent fair we also like to go look at the blacksmith vendors and uh, 
I'm just amazed by, you know, all the, the craftsmanship that goes into there. Like, you can tell that they're, you can really tell the difference between, like, a handmade sword and, like, mass-produced swords that you would mm -hmm. see at, like, the, yeah. like what you said, like, at Outdoor World. Yeah. I'll show you yeah. real quick. We have, we have a question from Tom. From, I know we also have a question from Thomas, too. So this is my grandfather's... No, it's not, Kayla. I thought that was... Let me finish. <laughs> no, this is not. This is a nice, pretty oh, wow. machete oh. that I bought online. This was not made by us. But, you know, it looked great. The price was really, you know, inexpensive online. But here's what happens when you go to chop into things that metal versus decorative pieces see what happens to it you see the chips in it yeah so that showed me that this is just a decorative piece it it uh yeah. it did that cutting on tree branches so that's this is the kind of stuff you get for the 50 bucks online at some of those little stores that sell pretty things so this is more just of a decorative piece. So if, if you took the orc sword and did the same work that this did, the orc sword wouldn't have even had a, a, a spot on it. Whereas this one here, you can see the uh, three chips in it there. That's think, really cool. I think you can see it. Yeah. So that's no, the difference that's between something that's uh, made with the quality steel that we use versus the soft metals that they make the pretty stuff out of. I know Thomas you, has a question before you okay. go, Jason. Yeah, no, no problem. And you can, so. How did you get started in your shop? So That's how did really we get started question. in our shop? So really he question. actually started with the knife making and then I fell in love with it and I was like, hey, I want to try this. Let's see what I can make. And I just now love making swords hmm. and yeah. knives. Um, another cool. thing you guys can do to kind of see a little bit about how this type of stuff uh, is done. There's a TV show on the History Channel. You Called, off my head again. Forged by Fire? Yeah. Forged in Fire. Forged in Fire. That's what I'm going to say. Now, you will have to remember, though, that that is a TV show. A TV show? Yeah. In fire? So they're rushed to do everything. So the stuff that they make in those, you know, short time frames that they uh, give you uh, usually aren't uh, great products. Um, but it gives you an idea on how the forges work, how to heat up the metal, how they hammer it. So you can, you can still pick up a little bit of, of watching that show. Have you guys ever made the the tear the uh, the spear tip that they used to have in the gun for that gun that they used to have back the bayonet that they used to have it back in the day? Uh, no, I have not made a bayonet just yet. Okay. Oh, we do have another question. Elena yeah. wants to know if we have an online store. No, not yet, girl. Not yet. Um, just because I don't have, I wanted to build up some inventory first before I put stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, just I didn't want to force everyone to have to put a special order in for it, you know, a custom order for everything. I wanted to have a, a little bit of inventory and the two Damascus ones that I'm almost finished with now were supposed to be for my inventory, but now they're both already spoken for. So, you know, they're, they're already taken before I'm finished. So. Good question, girl. So Willie wants to know, have you ever bought a knife at the store? Yes. Yes. Um, that machete that I just showed you was one that I bought. I bought that years ago before I, you know, considered doing this myself. And, uh, you know, I bought it for going camping and things like that, but it didn't hold up to the type of work because it was a, you know, $50 pretty knife that looked like it would do the work, but. Let's see, Melissa wants to know, do you make, Chef knives, yes. Yep, the two knives that it, we just showed you with the masters here. Yes, we do, girl. These are good oh, chef knives. One's a little bigger than the other. Got it. That's cool. We got the glare from the light back there. 
Okay, now look at the knife and see if anyone can see that. That's a no. So you have to That's cover the light so they can see it. Yeah. So these, um, but oh, basically wow. you're looking at the sizes. So here, let me yep. hold them. There you go. So these are two different sizes. I'll try to block that light for you, sorry. Two different sizes, but both, uh, both of these are chef knives. Um, so chef knives, you can make any size you like. Um, and this is two that I've made. So both chef knives. But I just love that Damascus, so I love showing that off. So, <laughs> <laughs> so pretty. He's pretty sharp. Smart. Yeah. Smarty. <laughs> Smart cookie. Uh, one more thing I'll show you real quick. One uh, more thing. Uh, when you make knives, you need a, a way to store them or hold them. So he this is just a little sheath that I make here in the shop to hold the knife so you can put it in your, you know, silverware drawer without it getting all scratched up or scratching other things up. So Very cool. If you don't want to put it in your wood block that most people have, then you can just put it in this and put it in your drawer. Do you mean how long does it take to get the knife sharp? Or how long does it stay sharp? Or how long does it take to stay sharp? Yes, that's what, how yeah. long, how long, how and long then you have to sharpen again. That, that is an excellent question <clears throat> on how long will it stay sharp. So, yeah, until it comes off. Everybody here most likely has stainless steel knives at home, right? Mm -hmm. you know, the knives that you can take and throw in the dishwasher. Yeah, uh huh. Everyone has those, but they're not usually not very sharp. There is a difference in those metals. So stainless steel is a metal that you can abuse. You can throw it in your sink, you can throw it in the dishwasher. The trade-off is that edge on stainless steel, you have to sharpen routinely if you wanna keep it sharp. Um, professional chefs usually don't use stainless steel because they would have to keep sharpening their uh, knives daily. Yeah, because I know they use it for coconut trees, some of them. Yep, you can yep. use them for those. Now, the trade-off is stainless steel won't hold an edge very long, but you can abuse it. You don't have to give it TLC. The high-carbon knives, like the Damascus knives or the spring steel huh. knives, those are high-carbon steels. Those you can't throw in your dishwasher. They will run. Oh, no, no, no. You can't abuse them. So you have to give them a little TLC. After you use them, you just rinse it off real quick and then dry it off. You can't leave water on it because it has carbon in it. So oh, okay. the yep. trade-off is these knives, you have to babysit a little bit more, but professional chefs use the high carbon mm -hmm. not because they don't have to sharpen them, but every couple of months versus almost daily for stainless steel. So there's, there's your trade-off. So Elena wants to know the best way to sharpen knives. Good That's question. a good question. That's what I was going to answer. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Hold on, let me unmute her. Tell me when to go. There she is. I got you. Hold on. There we go. There you go, girl. Yeah. So how? What would? What would be the best way to sharpen a knife if it's stainless steel or the the carbon? One. Well, they, they sell cheap knife sharpeners at Bed Bath & Beyond and stores like that. Um, and if you have stainless steel, those are usually the best to use because you, even when you get a stainless steel knife very sharp, and you know, if you use it a couple of times, it'll need to be sharpened again. Yep. So the high carbon steel knives hold the, hold the edge for a very long time even for professional chefs, it holds it for a very long time. And the best way, I'll give you two examples. The, the easiest way for me to sharpen a knife is on my belt sander. I use different belt uh, grits, you know, thick uh, sandpaper. So yeah. you use coarse ones if your knife is messed up or has never been sharpened before. And then you work your way up to real fine, like, 1,500 grit sandpaper when you're getting that final edge on it. That's the fastest way. The best way to sharpen a knife is with stones. I don't know if anyone here has had stones to sharpen knives or not, but 
Here's a quick example on, on stones. These are called water stones. So you put them in water for 15 minutes and then you have different grits here of stones. So you can see one is 1,000, one is 6,000. And so you can flip it over depending on what you're doing. So you can flip it over and you sharpen it on this side. That's, so this is just another one that I haven't finished yet, uh, a chopper chef knife. But you take it and you slide the edge on the stone. And this is the best way to sharpen knives, period. There's no better way to make a long lasting edge on any type of a weapon other than stones. This is one <clears throat> example of stones. These are called Arkansas stones. Mm -hmm. And because this particular stone, they mine from different areas in the country. And this one, Arkansas. Here is another stone that I actually prefer a little more. This is called a diamond stone. I think he got that one for his birthday. Yeah. So this one's called a diamond stone. And it has a grit of, uh, this one's called extra fine, but this is probably about 2000 grit. So this is used the same way. You can take your item that you need to be sharpened and you wanna run. And it takes practice because you have to have it yeah. at, at a, at a uh, exact angle because if your angle is too flat or too high, you'll end up messing it up. So you need to practice on <laughs> some of those stainless steel knives. You can practice on those. <laughs> and uh, diamond stones are the best, uh, in my opinion, so far. But this is the best way to sharpen a stone. And they sell lots of different kinds of different grits. Um, but this is the best way to sharpen any knife. Good question. Any last questions before we stop? I know Jason, I know Jason, you had a question. What up, Jason? It's oh, no, let's, uh, I think they, I think it was answered. So that was good. Yeah. Yep. Uh, good Any questions, last questions, everybody. Any last minute questions? Yes. No. I have enjoyed learning about the making of the nights and I can, pro I would like to propose a second session or even a third <laughs> session of the Social making making nice uh, knife knife club again. I agree with that a hundred percent. I'll work with yes. Jason on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kayla, and thank you, Mr. Eckerd. We really appreciate uh, your time and kind of giving us a glimpse into everything that goes on. If uh, people were looking for a picture of the knife, uh, one of the knives Kayla made that was on the Facebook posting today. So that was that was one that she provided. Uh, and yeah, so thanks again for letting us into your home, <laughs> into your shop. <laughs> uh, let me do uh, one, one last suggestion that down the road, if you guys uh, would uh, be interested in setting up a small group to come over sometime and see how some of the processes work uh, in person. Come on down to Calvert. <laughs> We'd be happy to, to have a field trip someday. Oh, yeah, that seems that's like, a uh, wonderful idea. It's going to be yeah. hard with COVID, but yeah, I don't see why not. Well, well, Me and my dad would be interested. All right. Well, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the generous invite. We will work that out. <laughs> it was nice having you guys. All yeah, right. Anytime. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, again, for joining on our social thank club. Thank you for joining. Uh, so we, uh, Knives Tonight, Thursday, remember, is a... Uh, is, uh, two uh, science experiments we're just gonna have some fun with science easy weird at home. science and then uh that. and then of course the dance on saturday so thanks yeah. everybody for joining thank Hi, you Jason. again kayla super Hi, thank you All too right. much kayla you're welcome. Good job, right. time for the long goodbye good <laughs> see you then good night good night guys